Compact 20 virtual gathering. I hope everyone did well in the Slack channels. We're about to get started with our next session, How to Facilitate an Exploration of Epistemic Justice and Community Engagement, presented by Star Paxton Moore, Director of Community Engaged Learning from the University of San Francisco, John Loggins, Director of Community Engaged Learning, and Chris Nave, Associate Vice President of Community Engagement, both from University of San Diego. So welcome to our presenters. Uh, but before we get started, a few reminders. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We have a few housekeeping items to share uh, before we get started. So first, please note that by participating in this event, you agree to abide by our code of conduct. conduct. Our staff will be sharing doo -doo -doo, um, this link in the chat now, so be on the lookout for it. We want to be a safe space for respectful, constructive conversation, so we appreciate you taking a moment to familiarize yourself with this policy. Second, if you have any questions for our presenters, simply type it in the chat uh, of Facebook or YouTube Live or whatever you're viewing from. Um, our staff volunteers will be compiling the questions for a Q&A session that will be happening at the end of the session. We'll get to as many as we can. If you have technical question, you can also post it in the Facebook or YouTube live chat, and one of our staff members will be able to assist you. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon, this evening, or this morning, depending on where you all are at. Again, my name is John Loggins, and I'm gonna kick us off by kind of just kind of going over the session overview. Uh, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide there, Marisol. Um, and for the overview, what we're going to do is we're just going to lay out what the plan is for our time together. Uh, we're going to kind of give you some background and some intro about the epistemic injustice and ongoing work we have with higher education. And you'll see how injustice is framed there in that we kind of examine injustice, but our hope is always to move towards how we kind of usher in more justice uh, in, in our work. Uh, we'll kind of give you some conceptual portals to epistemic injustice. We'll share a little bit of Fricker's work and some of the background on what epistemic injustice looks like. But we're also going to share how we each found ourselves into, found our way into this work and uh, realizing that we're all coming at it from different places and you all may have your own ways to enter into this conversation. Uh, then we want to kind of create a dynamic container to explore epistemic injustice. Um, and for that, I think, you know, when we were thinking about how we initially intended to have this session in at Hebus Compact Live with you all, uh, it was going to be a lot more interactive. It was going to be an opportunity for us to converse um, and, and share a lot of these stories. But we also realized that creating the space for those stories to exist is not always easy and simple and self-explanatory. So we're going to talk about how we, we've done it in the past and how we'd like to do it uh, with you all today. And then we're going to actually kind of model some of that work, um, you know, at our previous sessions, we've always had a kind of a fishbowl dynamic. Uh, for this session, we're going to be in the fishbowl and letting you all listen to some of our work and how we're trying to uh, address epistemic injustice and bring uh, justice into our work. And then uh, lastly, and this is part uh, Marisol had already mentioned, but uh, we want to invite you to share your thoughts and ask questions. I think this is a time to really value uh, the amount of people in this space. And if you have some experience with the work already and you want to share a thought uh, or ask us a question, that would be the time uh, we could be able to do that. Uh, next slide, please, Marisol. But to begin, uh, we think it's best for us to root ourselves in to place and to purpose. And realizing that we're not all in the same place, what I would like to do uh, is invite you all in the chat feature of the YouTube or Facebook or whatever medium that you're using right now, just to share your name and maybe if you would like to pay respect to the indigenous people uh, with historical and ongoing ties with the lands you're currently on. And while you're doing that, I'm going to read this uh, um, statement of, around land acknowledgments and why it's important for us to, to do land acknowledgments. Uh, we deliver a land acknowledgement to acknowledge the historical legacy of colonialism by honoring and paying respect to the land, which was taken by conquest, along with the domination of the people who inhabited the land and the imposition of white supremacy. We do it to raise greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and cultural rights as a small step towards equitable relationships and reconciliation. It also allows us to raise the question of what does it mean to live in a post-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here, and how can we be accountable to our part in history? 
We do a land acknowledgement not only to acknowledge the historical legacy of colonialism, but also to acknowledge non-Western ways of knowing that holistically link mind, body, and spirit, and link the human and non-human in ways of knowing. We are acknowledging that the space we are in, the land we are on, are part of who we are and how we know the world. It allows us to raise the questions about whose knowledge gets to be named, whose knowledge gets honored, validated, legitimized, whose knowledge gets erased, it's an acknowledgement that the space we inhabit shapes what we know and what we consider to be knowledge, how knowledge is constructed, what is legitimate knowledge, and who has knowledge. And we hope that this, again, will ground us to uh, our purpose and tell the rest of the conversation that we're going to be having today, because a lot of this is really represented in what epistemic injustice looks like, how it shows up in our worlds. And... Um, to get us going, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to share some of the background of the project that we've been doing in higher ed. Perfect. Thank you, John. And greetings to everyone and wonderful to be with you all and glad that Campus Compact is keeping us connected through this virtual gathering. Uh, and always appreciative to be part of this continuous conversation with my colleague Star and John Loggins and I believe John Saltmarsh, who is also with us. Uh, so as background, the preparation for these dialogues started in uh, December 2017, um, while Starr and John Saltmarsh and Marshall Welch actually began planning for the IRS conference in summer of 2018 in New Orleans, which now feels like a lifetime ago, uh, and continued into a convening in spring 2019 in San Diego at the Western Regional Continuums of Service Conference. Then in this past fall in Albuquerque at the Imagining America gathering, and of course, now we find ourselves here today. And John acknowledged our connection to land and place. And we thought it was important to also acknowledge the many voices that have shaped the stories behind these ongoing conversations. Uh, again, John Saltmarsh, Michael Rios, Tammy Moore, Gene Corbin, James Lynn, Adam Bush, Mary Castaneda, Jabari Brown, Marshall Welch, and Jennifer Turner, to name a few. And all these folks have added their own unique patterns to the mosaic of this work. Uh, and along with many others who have been vital in shaping our learning community over the past couple of years. But the question of what knowledge is accepted and whose wisdom is recognized is this old debate. And I know we all have our scars around the subject and it's very much tied to how we tell our stories. And so the background of this work is really animated by acknowledging the, the systemic exclusion of community-based knowledge in academia. And, and thankfully, despite that, we know community wisdom does not ask for permission to exist. And so thank goodness for mentors in the field like Dick Cohn, who many of you know recently passed, and he left this big footprint in the field during his time at USC, and he remained active in the field well into retirement. And uh, you know he was this tireless advocate for recognizing community knowledge as rigorous academic knowledge. And uh, he yearned for authentic and strong community ties, and, and thankfully his legacy lives on with the California Campus Compact Richard E. Cohn Award uh, which was recently awarded to our colleague Maria Silva. And so another voice who for decades has catalyzed this work and who had famous disagreements with the pioneers of service learning about understanding community knowledge is one of the pioneers herself, Nadine Cruz. And uh, I just remember many retreats, gatherings, crying sessions over the past 20 years where I recall Nadine's prophetic voice uh, argue, you know, in her words, that the structure of the academy's epistemology is too narrow. And if the work of community engagement is anything, it is to understand different ways of knowing. So I get an email from Nadine a few weeks ago, and of course she doubles down. And so that quote on the slide is from her email. And, you know, she, she wrote, you know, I'd like to suggest a perspective I've long preached about, and that's the urgency of embracing ways of knowing that we actually need, never mind the injustice of leaving them out to survive and to thrive as the kind of human beings we aspire to become. So, you know, I imagine if she had a mic when she was writing that email, she may have dropped it, but uh, be that as it may, I think her reflection about recognizing knowledge needed to heal the world and for society to progress is very relevant during these times. So it was important for us to acknowledge place and land, but we also wanted to ensure we wove together the voices, reflections of wisdom that, that really uplifts and informs this dialogue and propels the intention behind this work into a bridge for transformative justice. So with that, I'll turn it over to Star. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, it's an honor to get to be here as part of this conversation with 
um, my friends, John Loggins and Chris Nive, and sort of on behalf of, of the whole um, Epistemic Justice Project group. And I'm so glad that, that Chris Nive invoked um, our collaborators' names and of course invoked Nadine's words. Uh, and I think that really is an example of how each of the contributors in this project is inspired and guided by an array of scholars and activists and artists, um, and that these are the pe people that we look to to shape our work. And then also recognizing uh, and sort of grappling with the reality of the hegemonic academic system uh, within which we're doing this work and how higher education really proclaims that its purpose is uh, knowledge production and dissemination. And so as we sit with that, uh, the framework of epistemic justice and injustice feels, uh, has sort of specific appeal um, because it examines how injustice uh, is infused into how knowledge is exchanged and valued and used. So I want to take just a few minutes to talk about um, epistemic justice and injustice as our conceptual framework that's really guided our project. Um, and I'll try to do it very quickly. So Miranda Fricker, in her 2007 book, Epistemic Injustice, Power and the Ethics of Knowing, really uh, sort of puts forward this uh, assertion that epistemic injustice um, is the status quo, and I'm sure that's that feels uh, like a familiar sort of claim for a lot of us, uh, that the free flow of knowledge is restricted by our biases and that uh, it really keeps humanity from reaching its fullest potential because we are not uh, able to exchange knowledge um, in an unfettered way. And so Fricker talks about these two levels of epistemic injustice. The first one is testimonial. And testimonial injustice is the breakdown of knowledge being passed interpersonally. So when someone shares their own experience, expertise, knowledge, uh, testimonial with someone else and the person who is meant to receive that information because of identity-based bias uh, chooses not to believe or chooses to devalue that knowledge that's being shared with them, um, then it, it really has a, a negative impact both on that own person's understanding of the world, but it's also extremely dehumanizing, as you can imagine, to the person who is trying to convey that knowledge. Um, and then Fricker also talks about more of a systemic level of injustice, epistemic injustice, which she calls hermeneutical injustice. Uh, and in that case, it's really about how um, the cumulative injustice of not hearing, believing, or valuing entire groups of people uh, and their ways of knowing. And it keeps groups uh, of people from really contributing to our collective knowledge pools. And it keeps all of us uh, as human beings from accessing essential truths about the human experience. So I wanted to give a, just a quick example of what this might look like, particularly in community engagement. Uh, we might imagine a student in a service learning course that's being asked to do 30 hours of service, uh, direct service, um, as part of the course. And maybe this student is working multiple jobs to help them pay their tuition and, and other expenses. Uh, and so they have very real limitations in the extent to which they're able to engage in the learning experience that's been structured by the faculty member. Um, and I just want to name that Dr. Tania Mitchell has, has done some scholarship on this, so, so um, certainly there are places for us to build on. But we might imagine the faculty member hearing uh, this student's explanation of their, uh, their situation and, and their limitations and, and maybe suggesting other alternatives for how they might um, complete the course. But the faculty member, again, through uh, potential class or race or gender-based bias, uh, might not feel that the situation is a valid reason for modifying the expectations of the course. And so when the faculty member shuts, shuts this, uh, this exchange down, it really devalues the student's experience um, and reasserts hegemonic frameworks of how knowledge is supposed to be acquired uh, and disallows for alternative options for deep community-based learning. So that's an example of what would be testimonial injustice in community engagement. And then when we think about uh, hermeneutical injustice, which again is more at the, um, 
at the systemic level, I think we see that we are still as a field, as a, as a community engagement field, trying to figure out how to accommodate and honor um, the experiences and situations of students who are in similar situations, whether it's, you know, needing to work um, full time to get through school or caring for ailing parents or their commuter students or their single parents, right? And all of these things, you know, uh, Dan Buten sort of talks about this ideal service learning student that we typically design our courses for. How do we move away from that and really, um, broaden our uh, our pools of knowledge around who are the students coming into our community engagement experiences and how can we reconceptualize community engagement to honor the ways that they are strengthening their communities even if it doesn't look like the prescribed uh, service activities that we give them um, in our courses so um, so we've really found value in putting Fricker's framework in conversation with, um, with other scholars and with our own practice. But I also want to name that uh, as we do that, we are um, sort of struggling with, with, with the reality that it's very much centering whiteness. Um, Miranda Fricker is a white woman. Um, she's a philosophy faculty member, and she's very much situation, situated within the academy. So a lot of our conversations as a group have been about, you know, what role does this epistemic justice and injustice framework play for us? And in conversation with John Saltmarsh uh, last week or the week before, he was sort of inspired by Arundhati Roy's recent talk about the pandemic as a portal. And he suggested this metaphor of the portal as um, maybe being a helpful explanation for why and how uh, this particular framework of epistemic injustice was able to bring uh, this group together, the Epistemic Justice Project group, together from our diverse uh, backgrounds and epistem epistemological traditions um, to really collaborate on some pretty exciting work that hopefully advances justice within community engagement. Um, and so to that end, we wanted to just kind of share, take turns sharing what brought us into this project. And for me, I vividly remember being at a conference and having a conversation with John Saltmarsh and honestly being very starstruck because it was the first time I had gotten to um, interact with him. And I'm, I'm a doctoral student, so I'm sort of voraciously taking in as many theories as possible and uh, just being sort of amazed by how instructive they are in terms of shaping my work. And he had suggested uh, Fricker's work to me. And so, of course, I immediately went home and bought the book and read it as quickly as I could and uh, immediately was just thinking about who are the people that I know who are doing this, right, who are advancing epistemic justice, right, a addressing those injustices um, in how we engage in, with each other human to human. And, and really it was my colleagues at USD who came to mind. I've just always admired their work so much. Um, and so it was sort of a portal for me uh, to be able to reach out to them and say, this is how I understand your work and um, I've always admired it and you know, maybe there are some things we can do together. And so, uh, so that was really how I came in to, to be connected with this. And I want to invite uh, John and Chris to share as well. Thank you, Star. I, I, I am really appreciative to be invited into this work. And, you know, I have felt for a long time that this is, you know, uh, how I take up my role with community engagement. So much of how I see the work is creating spaces for us to really value and honor the wisdom that comes from community, the wisdom that comes from experience, and uh, community engagement is the, a great vehicle to do that. So when I was invited, and I think, you know, when Star, John Saltmarsh, and Chris Nive invite you to do something, Thing. You, you you take it and you say thank you and, and you're grateful for the opportunity. Uh, but the first thing I went and did was we went to the library and checked out Fricker's work. Uh, had a conversation with uh, my man Cord Brown, a uh, Cord Barnes, a uh, philosophy professor at USD, and had this great conversation. And I was really I was I was feeling it. Uh, but as much as I appreciated Fricker's work, I, I think the reason why I was feeling it wasn't so much of uh, everything that she is, was sharing in there. I definitely connected it to my own life experience as being a person of color. Uh, in my natural orientation to kind of resist authority and resist systems of oppression and injustice. So for me, it was kind of a, a natural segue into what I was already feeling. But, I, you know, 
in having these conversations and wanting to ground ourselves in where this work comes for comes to us from and how it lives in us, you know, it was, it was a great exercise for me to kind of dig in and do some unpacking. Uh, and so last night, like, you know, being anxious for this, this presentation uh, and, and kind of going through and having this deep dive of like, you know, how am I coming to this work? And, you know, I'm a notorious overthinker, but th in this particular case, it was in a really good way because I was really uh, reminded of, you know, family stories and being able to connect with grandparents and get wisdom that was generated there. But, uh, where it led me mostly was to music, you know, uh, thinking about uh, all the opportunities I had as a, you know, as an Air Force brat growing up in primarily uh, white communities, being the only person of the color in many of the classrooms I was in. It was consistently listening to um, uh, hip hop and R&B and jazz that really helped me say there's a different way of being. You can embody it the way you want. And, you know, and, and to be able to name some of them here in public is, is a great opportunity, too. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking of Dead Prez and, and Chuck D from uh, Public Enemy um, and how it was about resistance to authority and uh, systems of injustice. Uh, Graham Verbalizer from X-Clan, Black Thought from The Roots. I mean, his name is Black Thought. Uh, just to start off with, you know, uh, modeled different ways of, of how they knew things and the stories they shared and how they were sharing them was was unique and and their own. And then uh, finally, reminding me that I have my own work to do and how I internalize it. You have like Nina Simone uh, crying out, what it, what, wanting to be free, wanting to know how it feels to be free, and Bob saying, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Um, so when you look at that blog, uh, WordPress blog that Chris has put up there, we all have our kind of individual stories. And uh, one thing you'll notice about my story is that it's a very much an introspective piece, thinking about how I've internalized epistemic injustice. Uh, Mari Sal had said in the earlier session, like, you know, this work starts inward. You know, you, uh, if you want sustainable change, you have to be willing to kind of confront that stuff where it lives in yourself. And so for me to be able to say like, hey, you know, how often am I doing this to myself, whether it be through imposter syndrome or thinking that I'm not enough or what I'm presenting is going to be uh, treated as uh, an add-on or uh, a, a kind of emotional interlude in an otherwise academic space. I, I feel like for me, those have been opportunities for me to kind of live out challenge the system and challenge myself in doing the work and I'm really grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, John. So, um, and Star, it, it was in late 2017. In fact, I was looking at old emails and I sent it to Star. Um, when I get an email from Star and, and Marshall and John Saltmarsh about joining them for uh, the Pre-Conference Institute, uh, that this was gonna be in the summer 2018 Iron Slice Conference. And I remember reading Star's initial uh, email invitation and Star and I go back some years, but I remember thinking that, I think I'm gonna text her this acronym OHN, which is something I learned from Father Greg Boyle from Homeboy Industries, uh, OHN, which is like, oh hell no. And um, I was anxious because, you know, that these are three colleagues who I could genuinely feel wanted uh, to have my voice at the table but I was anxious because I knew I'd have to rehash some of the dark places that my own journey took. Uh, and I was like, look, I'm good. I'm here. No need to share my story. I did my work. Let's just move forward. Um, you know, there's pain in sharing the shadow work and I just did not want to tap into it at the time. But I knew that was not um, expansively thinking and that it was uh, important to be open to share that in my story and in this work, there's often despair. And you know, Cornell West said despair is good because it means you're not numb. And as long as you don't let despair have the last word, it could serve this higher purpose. So in the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Marisol. Through um, many deep dive conversations, it was important for us to say, okay, well, where do our stories fit? How do our stories create space for other stories? And lots of uh, deep dive conversations the past few years uh, in addition to the numerous other conversations that we've already kind of talked about, uh, about knowledge inclusion or exclusion, um, one ongoing theme that I know that I would often get stuck is, how do you name everything that informs this work in order to avoid excluding? And because I remember feeling marginalized, I was committed to not do the same to others, but in the quest to be inclusive, I know I inadvertently excluded different approaches to capturing stories and wisdom.
So the past couple of years, we had long conversations about different approaches and fields and disciplines and uh, who are the scholars and practitioners doing this work and how much do we dive into uh, liberationist testimonial or what about the role of story circles? Think about Jennifer Turner from the Community Book Center in New Orleans who implores, you know, what, does the, what do you get and what does the community get? Of course, critical race theory informs this work and, and then of course the, the work of artists, insurgents and radicals that we all know and love. And, uh, and is there room for Kiva or indigenous ways of governance and process? So, you know, all these became part of our discernment on how to ensure we were expansive in our understanding of different ways of knowing and weaving of stories. So we found uh, uh, Adrienne Marie Brown's book, in addition to Arundhati Roy's um, metaphor around the portal work that John had offered a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, the book Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. Uh, we found it very powerful for our process, and as many of you know, Adrian is an author, doula, transformative justice seeker, and their book was helpful in disentangling my concerns about excluding others and to focus on the idea that, um, you know, our collective work is continuously flowing with multiple entry points, with several converging and diverging points of wisdom, and all of it necessary. And uh, I do have to credit John Loggins for encouraging me to read the book. And Adrian shares this idea of looking at the natural world and looking for collaborative efforts, right relationships, and reminding us along the way that life moves towards life and longing moves towards longing. And uh, Adrian, like Nadine, has this prophetic wisdom and ability to make important links between our stories. And Adrian describes these elemental factors on the left and how they interact with their element, with their natural element in these real fluid ways. So. You know, a summary won't do Adrian's work justice, um, but as we consider how we create space for stories and especially wisdom needed uh, for the world, as Nadine implores, we wanted to offer this lens as a process to create some through lines and space for stories in a way that hopefully is emergent, uh, also rooted and, and expansive. John? Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we want to do is make sure that we're uh, acknowledging the stories that exist, but also kind of moving towards how do we move on them, make action, move more towards uh, more justice in, in the field. And, and I think uh, one of the things we want to do is model how we take up this work. I think, you know, uh, traditionally ways of knowing, would say we're going to present all the information to you, share it out and um, have it substantiated, peer reviewed. And, you know, all those are great things. I, I, I don't knock those, but I also want to, take the opportunity to say like, hey, can we do this in a different way? How do we explore these dynamics in, in a way that really is genuine and authentic and gives us the opportunity to kind of work through some things? And so uh, in doing that and how we've done it in the past is we've always kind of created a space for these stories to be shared within the group. Um, and uh, in order to do that, I think there's some some key things that we're I'm just gonna highlight here quickly and I, I'm highlighting it as, as tools to uh, how to do this work, but also to uh, share with you how we're going to be engaging in this conversation in, in a moment. Because I think, you know, what we're trying to do is create a space for us to be curious and, and inquire about some of the dynamics that we're seeing. You know, what we're doing isn't to name and put anybody on blast or call anybody uh, out for things. It's just naming a dynamic and, and, and what exists and how we're going to um, uh, work to, to make those changes. And I realize sometimes that makes people feel defensive. Sometimes that makes people feel... Uh, guilty or paralyzed, but you know the, the notion of creating a space around curiosity and inquiry really helps us uh, examine, and, and I hope that, that that comes through in what we are going to be doing. And then uh, turning our gaze inward and owning our own pieces. I think you know a lot of this conversation, as uh, I had mentioned earlier, is introspective. Like you know, if we can create a space where we can vulnerably share and, and talk about what's real and what's going on. Uh, not pointing fingers at systems and saying they only exist out there. They don't exist anywhere in me or in my smaller work groups or in my center is, is to say like, you know, I'm just putting that out on somebody else and I'm not willing to do the work myself. And how can you ask people to do the work when you're not willing to do it themselves? So what we're going to try to do is uh, share how we've been doing it, uh, what's come up for us, uh, the challenges challenges that exude in there and, and, and uh, acknowledge that this is something that we're trying to move towards action. And I want to get us started just in 
uh, naming and sharing how we took up this work at IR Slice in, in New Orleans, was that two, three years ago? I, I can't even remember it now. Um, but, you know, one of the things that uh, when we were, when I was first invited, or Chris and I were first invited to join this uh, work, we had the great opportunity, uh, wrote a proposal to present at uh, IR Slice, and we got a pre-con session, um, and we really wanted to do it in a way that kind of honored what it is that we were talking about, uh, how do we create some epistemic justice and share some other ways of knowing. And one of the things that Chris and I had been working on for a lot of years, uh, just post-Katrina, uh, was with a partnership at the Community Book Center in, in New Orleans, um, in, in the Treme on Bayou Road, a wonderful place of incredible black thought and energy. Uh, I think initially when we went out to New Orleans, uh, we were there like every other university and institution trying to figure out how we could support these communities that are in need uh, because they had this incredible uh, disaster that happened. Um, and uh, what we found was that there's plenty of ways to do it the way that are traditionally done, or plenty of ways to serve, uh, which I don't knock at all. Uh, I think there was valuable, there was a lot of need for houses to be built, uh, things to be cleaned up. Uh, but at the same time, re recognizing that reinforce a, a power dynamic that has been around for a long time. It's something that at USD we are already moving away from. And what we had found in New Orleans, uh, right next to the place that we were staying, which was uh, the um, Duchenne House, uh, which is run by the Sisters of the Sacred Heart, was an incredible book center that was a a book center. It's a bookshop, but how that place operated was people coming in and out, talking story. They were uh, self-proclaimed cultural first responders. Uh, they were creating a space for the people that were coming back at their own peril and their own risk uh, to create a space for them to feel welcome, a space for them to feel engaged and connected to the space that they are originally from. And we found a huge resonance with them, uh, me particularly. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I had grown up in as a military brat and didn't have aside from my immediate family, real sources uh, of, of black intellectual thought, places where we could convene, have conversation, speak on a language that I was resonating with and feeling, and uh, this space was that for me. You know, uh, We'd work with the students, and uh, students would have this great experience, and I would just stay put. I would sit there, have dinner, and watch movies in the book center, and, and really take it all in. And for me, it was something that I knew I wanted more of our students to experience, something that I knew was valuable uh, to what Nadine's point is. It's not a, an issue of injustice. It was like, this is needed in the world. How do we make sure that it's available for folks? And when we had the opportunity to present at IR Slice, I think Chris and I both thought, like, you know, if we're going to do this, we need to do it at the book center. Uh, we need to invite community members to help us facilitate this, and we need to make sure that we're valuing their wisdom and, and do all the things that, that show that we're valuing their wisdom, uh, providing stipends, uh, you know, really honoring their work. And all those things, I think, are, are great, but I, as, if many of you are community engagement professionals, you know that's not always the easiest thing to do in, in our fields is to really honor our community partners as co-educators of the way that they should be. And so for us to be able to do that and create that space in this you know, extended time in the pre-conference, which I acknowledge is, is a great thing, but I also would acknowledge that you know, pre-cons are, are, are add-ons, um, and, and, and I appreciate that. This is no slight to pre-cons. Uh, uh, I always like to be a part of them, but you know they're extras, and, and I feel like they're not embedded into the actual things. You're paying an extra premium for them. I think oftentimes because the content is great, but also oftentimes so the organizations don't incur the costs of doing them. So, like to recognize that there are certain spaces where you can do these things and certain places where you can't is also one of the pieces that uh, I think is worth exploring. And Marisol, I think we're still, we're not quite yet at the conversation with participants, uh, but uh, we're going to engage in, in how we're all taking up this work. So, um, so maybe I'll respond. Again, we were, we've been having conversations over the past week. And um, one of the things that I really appreciated um, from the beginning when Chris and John Loggins decided to join was just um, their complete sort of trust and openness to um, 
to really connecting our project with their ongoing relationships and their ongoing um, community work. And it really, it sort of, for me, is very much linked to um, Adrienne Marie Brown because I think of, um, you know, in her writings and, and in her teaching, uh, she's incredibly expansive and generous and in inviting everyone to figure out how to um, uh, come into uh, participating in social change, right? And, and she's gracious about people uh, fumbling their way through that. And um, and I, I just felt sort of that same graciousness with, with John and Chris. Um, I also feel like I had an experience in our group that was a, a bit of a contrast to it and definitely uh, sort of a humbling learning experience. Um, I also wanted to invite one of our community partners to participate in this project, um, James Lynn from Glide Foundation, and he's been part of it um, for most of, of the time our project has, has been um, moving forward. But early on, we didn't have... Um, we didn't have many community partner voices in kind of the bigger project. We had done the work, uh, the session with the community book center, and it was a huge success. And we were having these conversations among us, and I think at the time all of us were um, sort of more in the academic space. And we were like, okay, well, let's create this framework for the project. And, uh, but we want to have community partner voices, and we want to make sure, you know, because they're often left out. And, you know, when should we bring them in? And, and, you know, I think there were sort of diverse ideas about like when and how do we bring in community partner voices, recognizing that they're so essential to shaping our work. Um, and so I remember thinking, okay, well, I feel like we should have some kind of a proposal that we can go to them with. And so um, I sent my friend James Lynn, uh, who we've worked with for over 10 years at Glide. I sent him this proposal and I said, I, you know, we'd love for you to, to be a contributor and help us figure this out. And, um, and again, talk about grace as kind of the overarching theme um, for me. He, uh, he responded and he said, this is really exciting, Star, and I'd love to talk with you about it. And so we set up a, a conversation. Um, and he had really read uh, and thought deeply about this proposal. And so he had, you know, sort of these wonderful thoughts and responses. And then towards the end of our conversation, he said, you know, I, I think, and I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but essentially he was um, in his own gentle and, and loving way, sort of calling me out as like, it looks like you've sort of already figured this out. Like, what are you really... Are you really coming to me because you want my voice to, to be part of this? Or are you sort of coming to me with this ready-made thing and you have figured out, you know, particular ways that, that you want me to plug in? Um, and as I said, he said it much more gently than that. But it was really a beautiful sort of um, wake-up call or calling out or calling in or however we want to um, name it of uh, really re-examining, okay, you know, what, what are the ways that we, you know, are internalized um, sort of patriarchal forms of, of being in relationship with community partners and um, that particular interaction, but also his willingness to still be part of this project and really come into this space and, and share his voice um, in generous ways has been so formative in how I've thought about this work. So, um, thanks, Star. Uh, you know, admittedly for me, the action part um, you know, I think about a lot that the, the like the what next question is very important, and that's why um, a lot of the different approaches and, and considerations and approaches and layers we've discussed the last few years, you know, are helpful for me, and why Adrian's work in particular is helpful, and specifically the adaptive piece. You know, this concept of how do we understand how we change and its connection to resilience and transformative justice. So when I'm thinking about this, like what next? or the action steps, you know, also reminds me of when Cornell West said that in terms of change, he said, be like a blues singer, take that energy in your experience and make music. Uh, so, and, you know, in other words, I had to take Nadine's encouragement in her email seriously and ask myself, so, you know, what do I offer? Which is this question that I still am not quite sure, probably because I have two young boys who constantly remind me uh, of their uncertainty of that. But, um, you know, so what do I offer? 
the world needs to advance as a more humane society. And uh, this idea of measuring one's worth is this lifelong skill, even as Amanda McBride and Eric Mullen in their recent work reminded me that um, in the academy, sometimes self-confidence is appreciated over community wisdom. So the past few years, my meditation has been about what my friend Das John Jordan frames as the additive element of transformative justice. I don't think he framed it like that. It's just the way I kind of put it together in my head. Um, because I kept feeling like I'm this middle-aged person of color who is now in a privileged position and I have no street credibility with young graduate student people of color. And uh, so we were having this conversation because I was being defensive and he said, you know what I try to tell my peers? Like this is intergenerational work that's happening here, right? He goes, you know what I tell my peers is that, you know, what do you add to the conversation? So, and that just kind of stuck with me that if I'm serious about my story contributing to action, then um, there's this cumulative effect that must be a net gain. You know, when I was serving the smaller space and not wanting to join the conversation or really respond, um, star John and Marshall first reached out, it was because I, you know, I was focusing on my loss and deficits, which is something, you know, I do quite a bit. And um, now my themes revolve around Adrian's notion of transformative justice, you know, combined with Nadine's imperative of knowledge needed for society to advance. So, you know, together, I think it's just much more of this expansive and reflex reflexive view of knowledge and wisdom that becomes more available in the academy when viewed, um, you know, as part of this long stream of consciousness with more stories that are still untold. Um, and even when I continue to have my very conflicted thoughts about my own story and contribution, um, and as unsettling as this is for me to be part of because of the constant reflection into the shadows, uh, you know, I know it's necessary and tethered to these deeper ancestral roots, um, while also being emergent and centered around doing what is right. So, so I think those are just some of our reflections and, and I think we wanted to invite others to contribute. Is that right, Star and John? Sure, yeah, that would be great. I did want to, while they're generating some of the questions, like I think one of the things that, um, I, again, thank you both for sharing and um, it's, uh, thinking about like us doing the work and kind of uh, making sure that we're, we're attentive to it and how difficult that is. But I, I also, you know, uh, as much as I am committed to doing that work, uh, how difficult it is for me to do it reminds me of how difficult systemically it is going to be to course correct ships that have been sailing so long about like, this is how we value wisdom. We are the, the you know, the uh, holders of all the keys to wisdom because we are this academic university and we can charge you for this wisdom and like to, what it takes to actually spread that out is going to be, you know, a, a heavy lift, a monumental thing. And I think ultimately that's a lot of what we do in community engagement is try to create spaces for that wisdom to, to exist. Right. I would actually um, just sort of connecting that back to both Adrian Marie Brown and, and Miranda Fricker. What I appreciate is that they they offer up these multiple um, levels and entry points and kind of honor them as all being valuable. Right. So with Fricker talking about testimonial injustice and ultimately testimonial justice is about how do we listen deeply to each other, believe each other, um, honor each other's knowledge and wisdom. Um, and that's something that we can do in our day to day interactions with people. It's a practice we can cultivate. And then similarly, uh, with Adrian Marie Brown, I, I really appreciate the concept of fractals that, you know, the, the interactions we have interpersonally with each other or the small scale changes that we um, that we try to make within our uh, within our offices or within our uh, institutions, you know, can have cumulative effects. And I, I also think about actually something Nadine Cruz said in, in a workshop that I went to years ago, like very early on in my career. Um, and she talked about community engaged learning or service learning as being these opportunities for students to create small scale experiments in social justice. And it was just so mind blowing to me um, to sort of uh, set it up for students to have this agency of like, I could come into an organization and if I'm coming in with that mindset of trying to engage with people respectfully and um, with the notion of uh, trying to advance justice and equity, then I can 
um, essentially be part of these small scale experiments that will that will ultimately proliferate. So um, I, I appreciate John that there's there's sort of this like heaviness of like so much needs to be changed. And I also find so much hope and inspiration in how so many of the scholars that we reference uh, are really inviting us to be able to start small um, and, and, and honoring that that will have an impact also. Thank you all for, for that presentation as we're getting um, questions. And I, I have one my, myself. So I hear a lot of what you were saying about the ability to listen, right? That part of the epistemic justice is on the ability to listen. But we know that through colonialism, so many of our voices have been stifled, shut down. So in order to listen, someone needs to be able to speak. So what is that first work with the individual that needs to happen to have the agency to feel like what they are going to share is worthy of, of sharing when so many systems have has uh, stifled that has put has put that down um, so if you can think about that and we've got more questions to come but as we were as you were talking those were some of the things that that i was thinking about what is that essence first in the self that needs to happen to feel like you have that agency to be able to have voice, especially when you've been in systems uh, of, of colonialism and, and oppression. You know, uh, if, if I could, I, I would just say like, I think, you know, uh, to get activated into the work, I think that you can come, I think everybody's different in how it shows up and, and, and what kind of resonates, uh, but like to be intentional about the spaces that we're creating. I, I, I do think that, um, you know, creating spaces and partnerships that really and truly do value the wisdoms of, of, of community. Uh, and by example, like, you know, one of the things that I know, we've had this wonderful program uh, as well in Jamaica for over 15 years now. Um, and when we first started that program, it was, you know, we're a Catholic institutional, uh, um, uh, pre predominantly white identifying students would be joining our programs. Like it was completely, um, you, you know, uh, white students that, that were in our program, but I think as we started to really lean into valuing the partners as co-educators, from the house moms to the community partners, everybody we told them to treat us professors, um, and word got out. It was it was quick to it was nice to see how quickly uh, students of color kind of flocked to our program, um, and and it gave them a, a lot of agency and activated them to know that they can get learning from a place where, you know, how much pushback we got back from some of the parents initially, like, well, what, are the, what can my child learn in Jamaica? You know, I was like, well, <laughs> what can they not learn in Jamaica? Um, and, and, and I think, you know, to give them that space to, to do it and then to provide a container for them to actually start to explore it when it does happen. I think, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's not in Jamaica, if it's in the classroom and you are, when, you know, I have the privilege of being able to instruct and co-instruct some leadership courses and like, you know, we'll go over the content of the course, but we always create a space for us to analyze the group dynamic of the room so things can get named. Like, you know, I, I noticed that the first three people to speak were, were men or, you know, uh, every time somebody spoke, there's this dynamic that happens. You have the space to know that it's okay to be questioning those things and explore them and, and challenge those dynamics as part of the conversation as opposed to just saying it's only about content. It's not about how we interact and how we move that conversation forward. And uh, being consistent about that, disciplined about that, and and realizing that they don't like it at first. Like, I can't believe you called me out on this or like you get really defensive and like, you know, Chris and I have had students that left class on us before and, you know, had students that haven't talked to me for a while, but, you know, uh, generally they all come around. And again, it's not that we're forcing anybody to do anything. We're just creating this container for it, for it to exist. Okay. Right. So let me get to some of the questions from um, our, our, our audience. So how do we reconcile epistemic justice with sifting through information based on the authority and consensus of the sources. What if these authorities perpetuate the exclusion of certain voices? Yeah, um, actually, I was just I was just thinking about um, in uh, Miranda Fricker's book, she talks about um, we have a responsibility individually to build our capacity to um, invite and honor uh, diverse ways of knowing. And so I think so much of it really requires faculty and uh, people in positions of power 
both within the academy and outside of the academy to to um, proactively um, resist those uh, sort of easy paths of, of trying to sort of sustain the status quo in terms of whose voices are seen as experts and and uh, who gets cited and who uh, who gets to talk in class and and uh, all of those things um, just one example at USF we uh, have a service learning requirement we've switched it that we've switched the paradigm to a community engaged learning requirement there's a lot of reasons for that but uh, one of the sort of dimensions of uh, community engaged learning that that faculty have to uh, integrate into their course is recognizing community partners as co-educators, right? And so I know that term has been used uh, by a number of scholars in our field, but still I think among faculty across disciplines, it, it's often still unfamiliar. And so things like that, where we sort of uh, name this as a requirement for how we're going to do the work, and then we have to do lots of education around what does it mean for community partners to be a co-educator and, and what sort of wisdom and expertise do they bring and how do we honor that and how do we make sure that their voices shape our curriculum and provide ongoing feedback um, on student uh, performance. And so, um, I think sometimes we see that we are in positions where we can um, insert uh, frameworks or policies that might help us um, to, to re-envision that. I think another thing I've seen is where universities will review syllabi to look at, you know, how many authors of color are included on, on the reference list, or I think those types of things can be very powerful, like very practical steps. Yeah, and I would probably even say like supporting community news sources as places where knowledge is created, right? So not only in what we do in the classroom, but what we do in our own uh, actions. Um, so another uh, question, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna quickly add that um, this was a, a conversation point for us for, for the last few years, because I think it was important for us to look at other venues where, you know, like production is exchanged, right? Just like, again, Community Book Center, artist spaces. Um, we love the way that Imagining America, um, you know, mm -hmm. used as public as a way to get out publicly engaged information. Two other things for me, just simply, and I think that's why the immersive component is really powerful, um, and kind of in Adrian's work is this idea of presencing. Like, to me, um, going into a community space, truly just because you want to be with that person and have no university agenda, I think uh, role models to say students or other faculty or whoever that um, that kind of knowledge is worth being in the presence of. And so there is a lot of self work to sit there because it often gets uncomfortable. Sometimes it's hot. And, uh, you know, if you want to be, if you want to have these kind of like reciprocal democratic partnerships that I know we, we talked about quite a bit, you know, that space isn't always about hugs. You know, a lot of it is a lot of pain. And, and so I think, again, Adrian Marie Brown says, um, you know, if you trust, that will develop and join trusting relationships. So I think to me, these are like lessons learned that are cultural lessons you learn, you know, not necessarily academic lessons, but I think that's also important to do is just kind of sit there. And I also think that the different uh, positions we sit on our campuses, for me, I have to take that default switch out of my head when I'm like in normal spaces. Like, can we just have a, a normal conversation? And so, you know, it's nothing, it's not a theory, it's just the way of being. Mm. That reminds me of in some of the reflections we have around our civic action plans, especially with an equity lens, one of the things that we're asking institutions to think about is what is their reputation of harm with the community and sitting with that, right? And what, what does that mean as a way to, to begin that shift? We have another question that I'd like um, for you all to answer. So, um, it says, I'd love to hear more about facilitating these kinds of transformative, vulnerable, and honest conversations. Are there best practices you would recommend, especially in early talks or introductions? So any best practices on sort of getting started with this analysis? Um, I think it depends on the context that you're, you're, you're doing it in. If it's a, in a course, I think being very clear and upfront in, in your syllabus about this is an opportunity for us to kind of engage in these conversations. So I, I do think that there's a space for it in no matter what the discipline or the field is, if you are going to be engaging in the community, there's going to be elements and layers of 
of knowledge that are coming in that needs to be processed and uh, making sure that students know that there's a space for it. Um, and uh, if it's a student leader working in community engagement, again, uh, I think in both cases, it's about being deliberate and being consistent. I always share with the uh, students that I work with that it's a practice. It's not something that you just get to turn it on and off and think I'm, I'm, I'm woke uh, and then you're done with it. It's like it's ongoing. You're always waking. You're always uh, trying to stay in that woke space. Uh, and depending on what's going on in your life, it's going to vary. Like you may have a good handle on your uh, – masculinity but have a hard time understanding sexuality and those two things are two different spaces um, mm -hmm. and, and, and and that feels disconnected a little bit from epistemic injustice but I think it's it's around the conversation of what's coming up for 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 students because like you know when you're putting them out in the community and they're exposed to wisdom that's coming at them and having new experiences I can't predict what's going to be uh, alive for that student and being able to create a space where I can be responsive to everybody um, is, is important, I think. And, and so how does that come up now with this kind of virtual world that we're, we're living in, that students are not doing direct placements, they're not sort of engaging in those individualized personal conversations with community partners um, that way? Are, are there any things that you've instituted sort of this past semester as you made that transition? Just a plug for Campus Compact, the last podcast, the idea of how do you stay connected. Um, you know, I think the concept of mutual aid is so key, right? Because you can do that both virtually and then just kind of from your porch. And, you know, one of the, you know, a lot of the history of mutual aid comes from these black benevolent associations back in the day when um, you had to raise money for insurance costs or for funerals or for a whole, for the light bill. And so I think that can extend um, into kind of the, the virtual world. Um, and, you know, I'll say another thing. I, I don't know about in terms of a best practice, but it's just like this intense, I mean, a, a practice of our field is the reflective practitioner. And, um, and, you know, intense reflection on, you know, I talked about kind of like why I was so reticent in coming to this conversation because I got to get into the shadow work. Uh, John Loggins, a few years ago, we were doing our strategic plan. He was like, man, let's put love in our strategic plan. I'm like, man, you know, we're going to put love in our strategic plan. See? <laughs> and, and, and running towards these things that you know will make you better and more expansive. And so I think in terms of a best practice, I, for me, what resonates the most, I'm, I can't believe I'm admitting this, like I, I, I love listening to Anthony Bourdain, rest his soul like the way he enters into community. And because I grew up Filipino and my mom was like, the way she showed me love was by food. And so she would be like, like literally it'd be an hour before I'm gonna go hang out with friends and eat and she'll have a full on six course meal. She'd be like, oh, just a little snack. And um, that's how she showed me love. So uh, like to me, a best practice when I watch Anthony Bourdain or other chefs connect uh, culturally in a way that's very humble, that is reflective and that's present. I think to me, that's something that I kind of resonate with. Thanks. And so before we close out, there's one last question. I'd like you to answer this as succinctly as possible. Um, have you found any connections to community care and healing through these conversations and actions? So any connections to community care and healing? I mean, I can speak briefly to this, and I, I don't know if this is like the best place to leave it, but we did a session at Imagining America where we realized that uh, people like some really challenging things were surfacing with people through the conversation and we hadn't as a group figured out how to attend to care and healing as part of the conversation uh, that we were facilitating. And so I think for our project, that's a growing edge. I mean, I don't wanna speak for others. They might have sort of individual practices of that, but I think it was a shortcoming that we recognized in, in that particular session that we need to really be much more mindful of. And we actually entitled through the conversation and we hadn't as a, oh, I don't know if I'm putting out. <laughs> um, but anyway, we had someone from, from that session actually join a subsequent call to kind of talk more about that with us, and it's something we hope to integrate more, I would say. 
Right. And I would just briefly add that I think it may not always feel that way, but anytime you're doing internal introspective work, it's healing. It, it right. doesn't feel like that all the time. It feels like it sucks sometimes, but ultimately it's making you more authentic. It's making you more genuine and more capable of, of loving the people and accepting the people around you. That's right. Right. Well, I just want to thank uh, you all for this wonderful presentation, getting sort of these thoughts um, on our minds and uh, engaging us in this uh, conversation. Um, you know, look up the work of Star and uh, John and, and Chris as you move forward. Um, we're going to be taking a 15 minute break um, and then uh, we have uh, another session coming up. So please be on, on the lookout. We'll have our Slack channels. And um, thank you all for the work that you're doing, uh, helping us think more deeply and working towards justice. I appreciate it. Thanks. Peace and love, y'all. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.